Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert. The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. There's some amazing ideas out there. We haven't got the answers. None of us. Mm -hmm. Every situation is slightly different as as Dave Snowden would say, that's the problem, right? That's the problem with <laughs> exactly. complexity. Uh, just because this, there's no such thing as best practices, but there are such thing as practices and empiricism and those things really help us. So let's, um, let's build some bridges and change the world. Originally, I started this uh, podcast as like, you know, I was talking to some people. I like, I miss talking to people. I miss going to conferences. And there are some people like yourself and others, like I've gone down for the uh, uh, scrum uh, uh, give thanks. Thanksgiving, give thanks and stuff like that. But like, uh, I, I'm talking to like also across different frameworks. So I'm talking to David Anderson. Yesterday, I spoke with Scott Ambler and I'm like, <laughs> there should be more collaboration. There should be more like, sometimes I feel like we're, uh, uh, there's not enough love <laughs> between well, the different. Uh, I, uh, I agree. I, and that's yeah. one of the reasons why I think at scrum.org over the last five years, since I've been running scrum.org, I spent a great deal of time trying to build bridges. Yeah. Hopefully you notice that the tone of scrum.org is very collaborative. It's yes and not yes, but. Yeah. We may not agree with everything that everybody says, um, mm -hmm. but we always respect them when we assume best intentions. Um, yeah. And that message we push into our community, our trainer community, and into obviously our own marketing and how we position ourselves. Because I, I think, you know, Scott, I, you know, I've known Scott for almost 20 years, um, met him when I was working on RUP. And uh, he's got some amazing, incredible ideas. I don't agree with everything that his, his perspective is, yeah. uh, but, but I do value his insight. And, and I know for sure that if you'd say, no, you're an idiot in the first sentence, any chance of him listening to you or you listening to him is negated. So yeah. I, I think that we need to, and so Scrum Alliance is a great example. Scrum.org is only here because of the amazing work that Scrum Alliance did. Mm -hmm. um, do I agree with some of the approaches that Scrum Alliance does? No, I, I, I don't. I like having consistent training. I like having a decoupled assessment. Yeah, fair enough. But the but do I respect what Howard and the, and everybody is and Melissa when she was there were doing? Yeah, yeah they're awesome people. I mm -hmm. I honestly believe best intentions. And, mm. uh, and that's true of Dean, who is the person, the reason why I live in America is because of Dean, well, he signed yeah. the check. So <laughs> moving me. So, uh, yeah. so uh, I, I'll have to respect him. Uh, and do I think sometimes that commercial interests outweigh uh, uh, mission interests? Well, you know, maybe, but the reality is you have to balance those two things. And, uh, and ex exactly. And like in, in talking to, to everybody, like that's like everybody's on the same page. I think everybody understands and like there, there's so much more alignment and agreement yes, I when I talk agree. to uh, obviously the business side and sometimes we, like you said, uh, some other commercial things like, you know, might. But there is so much potential. And I think, you know, I want to come back to Ken because I think without Ken, none of this or not it, Scrum and Agile wouldn't be where it is without Ken. And I think he was probably the biggest catalyst. But I want to maybe go back first to uh, how did you end up leading development at uh, RUP? And an, uh, yeah. let, let's start there. And then uh, we'll come back to some of the current stuff. Mm. and. So I started at the beginning. So this was sort of 20, over 20 years ago. So some, maybe some of your listeners are like uh, still in school back, back in those <laughs> days. Uh, it is incredible how time flies. I know my, my parents always said that to me and I always like just laughed at them, but honestly, it, it really does. So I was, um, uh, so I joined um, Rational Software from a company called Select Software Tools. And so I spent like three or so years in England, basically consulting, you know, in a car, driving around organizations, trying to introduce the, the things like object-oriented analysis and design, things like um, the UML. Um, initially, it wasn't UML, it was OMT plus the Booch method. So we spent a lot of time on that. And, and I met 
uh, a gentleman called Kurt Bittner who actually now works here at, at scrum.org and I met Dean and I met Eva and I met Walker because of that yeah. so when an opportunity came up to lead the rationify process at a key time when it sort of they'd done that initial creation and it was kind of like, what is this? Is this a commercial product? Is it not? So I had the opportunity to bring all of my consulting experience and everybody liked me, I suppose. Uh. In commerce. Uh, and to, and I, so I moved to Boulder, Colorado and uh, working for in the PPMBU, it was called, which was run by Dean Leffingwell. And it had all of the processy stuff and the tools, ClearQuest, all that stuff in this one thing. And the idea was we were going to build this very interesting product that was RUP plus all these, you know, explicit mentors for uh, industries and all this sort of stuff. And, and it was really, yeah. really exciting. And um, I really value those years that I spent with the RUP. I learned so much and working with Eva, uh, who, who I then ran his business for a little while, Grady Booch, um, Jim Rumba, not so much. I didn't spend much time with him. Um, Walker Royce, Philip Christian. Yeah. Uh, and there was this agile thing happening at the same time. And interestingly, Grady was invited to that original Snowbird meeting. Because yeah. I don't know Grady Booch, right? He's he's such a nice dude. And um, he really is a gentleman. And But he couldn't go. And so the email ended up in my inbox. And, and I remember asking, saying, is this, should we do something here? And the client was, no, aren't they the rad guys? No, no, no. Because we, we, uh, we were the de facto standard. And well, it's just, it's funny, though, because I yesterday I also spoke with uh, John Kern, and, he, you know, he, it, it was uh, Peter uh, Code that was supposed to go, and Peter is like, you know, no, John, you go, and it, it was just like, you know, it, it was just accident, you know, in a sense, and like, uh, we're talking about just like, you know, every single uh, person that was there says like nobody really I mean it's just like we, we were skiing and drinking half of the time half of the time we were <laughs> meeting like nobody knew that it's gonna happen you know uh, start it's serendipity moment. right it's yeah. chance it's and that's the nature of these things I mean talking to Ken and uh, Martin Fowler and, and yeah. others about that experience Jim Highsmith as, as well it was interesting that it was just the right time it was a bit like when you meet your wife or you meet you know that moment it's just time yeah. Timing. you know if exactly. you met that person a year before it may, she may not have become your wife it's exactly. all about serendipity or you know timing and um and i think amazing things happened uh it disappoints me that some of the great ideas that we were working on with Rup, you know sort of were considered to be the enemy and yeah. uh, i think there could have been a much better compromise maybe but mm -hmm. ultimately it the right thing happened um and ken i met ken about the same time at, at a conference and he told me he said i said i'm the root product manager and he said you're an idiot i was like great <laughs> and he was right it turns yeah. out um because we never really the rup became this sort of like all encompassing they need to do this and this and people were not very smart at taking things out and choosing what to do so they ended up with this incredibly complicated process which ultimately didn't serve them well and that that mm -hmm. was the problem whereas scrum as, as you well know lightweight framework e relatively easy to adopt meaning mm -hmm. easy in terms of intellectually oh this is how you do it very hard to get right because of the constraints of the environment around you and the problem that you're solving but it, you 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 sort of start from something and then grow rather than do with rup which is start with a massive thing and then take things out which which yeah, never really but, worked yeah it's really interesting and uh you know maybe just to uh uh like something that i've been thinking about is like uh, uh you know are we the, uh, at that same point now with all the frameworks with all the talks like it seems like uh, you know a lot of things have changed over the last 20 years but a lot has not changed either because like when i look at you know organizations uh like and, and you know not to pick and safe again you know i think yeah. you know lean uh, uh dean has done a great job and again talking to dean i took his class too and like in a sense like <laughs> like these are the people that get it i understand it it's the demand from the clients and sometimes their desire to just for quick answers um but what are your thoughts? Do you think we're, uh, 
my question is, do you think we're going to move away from frameworks that are prescriptive and more towards frameworks that are pattern-based and more contextualized? Or where do you think we're, we're going with the current I, state of agile? I, I mean, if, if I could answer that question, you know, I'd be far more successful than I am, I'm sure. <laughs> However, yeah. the, um, the, it's interesting what you said. You, you, the problem that we have with things like SAFE and, and, and the like isn't isn't safe <laughs> it's how exactly. they're being implemented by their clients and and you know the intent of all of these whether it's less whether it's safe whether it's dad whether it's all of these things is, is that, that what people are trying to do is they're trying to apply this thinking in their current mindset or their what i describe okay. as the industrial paradigm you know we used to call it waterfall but it's something much bigger than waterfall. It's about how things are funded, how you align to your customer, how, how staff uh, are promoted, how they're, you know, all of this stuff is built around basically an efficiency mindset or an industrial mindset. And I think mm -hmm. that until that starts changing, it's going to be hard to see the success. And are these frameworks useful? Gosh, yes. Is it important to learn them? I think it's very hard to apply an agile mindset without spending some time thinking about the using Scrum or Kanban or whatever, and thinking about empiricism, self-organization, and using these frameworks to help you do it. Right. Now, uh, will we move to something else? I, I, I really don't know. I think the problem, though, isn't the frameworks. I think the problem ultimately is the lack of said. real desire for organizations mm. that have history and legacy and success to change things. You know, they've got a lot to lose, right? You know, mm. the, the, the reality is that the SpaceX is the Teslas, even to some extent, the Amazons built businesses. And because of that, they were allowed, they didn't have the anything to lose. So they tried things. It's yeah. harder for a large institution that's got hundreds of years of experience, systems and legacies and processes that, that are so complicated because of evol ev evolution of that. It's hard to see how they will change their mindset, but the reality is we are starting to see it. We're seeing it in organizations that have leaders that appreciate that they're moving to this digital age and they're fundamentally changing their operating model incrementally you know, business line by business line, customer by customer, but they are starting to do that. Um, and then will frameworks still exist for them? I, I, for the next five years, yes, I think. Yeah. I think for the next five years. I mean, I don't think like maybe just to rephrase, it's not necessarily the frameworks, is it, it's like blindly trying to follow a framework, even Scrum that doesn't have, you know, uh, uh, it, it's a very lightweight framework, but uh, if people don't have, I, I call it like all the ingredients for that recipe, then they just either start throwing stuff or they don't know what they're doing. So like uh, it, it's uh, something resonated that uh, John Kearney said yesterday, we just got to start using our brains and start thinking. <laughs> like, yes. like, uh, I, the last slide I have on many of my presentations is don't leave your brain at home. It's yeah. funny, you know, the Scrum Guide was updated at the end of uh, the year last year in November. And one of the real changes, the philosophies of the change anyway, the, or the sort of motivation, dare I say, the goal of the change was to reorient Scrum so it was more explicit around mm -hmm. it's a process or a framework for effectively delivering value incrementally in an environment where you don't know lots of things. So, you know, the, the focus of the, the get rid of the development team and the one Scrum team focused on delivering a, a, a potentially valuable use increment right the idea of the product goal so at scrum.org we you know went through and we did a, updated our training classes and you know all that stuff and updated all our assessments the the first day that the new assessment hit the um hit the sort of world people yeah. kept getting wrong a lot of questions that were around value and so I did some analysis. So we pulled some of those questions back and we looked at them. We talked to a bunch of people and we found that a lot of organizations are using Scrum to deliver work. They're not using necessarily Scrum to deliver value. The product owner really is a project manager. And, yeah. and the team work comes into the backlog from some magical planning process. The product, the product owner prioritizes that work, looking at the constraints. The sprint focuses on a small chunk of that work. Sprint mm -hmm. goal is really hard to find. Product goal, the product has 
is not really a product it's supporting multiple com you know business lines you get yeah. this sort of very efficiency because maybe this team's got a particular specialty around this one application in the case of software or this one discipline in the case of marketing or something so that the team that is not is part of this very big complex process they're not yeah. necessarily aligned to the customer so value is kind of missing and because of that, self-management or historically self-organization doesn't happen because mm -hmm. they don't really, how will they? They might organize around the work, but they don't organize around the outcome. They're not mo particularly motivated because they haven't yeah. got that purpose really clearly understood. You know, and that probably things. points out too, like if you're not focused on outcomes and you're not fo if you just focus on getting stuff done, then it doesn't get you closer to the customer, right? And the user. And ultimately, you're dispensable because you could yeah. take this chunk and throw it into another, one, you know, and how you feel is that way, right? So mm -hmm. the, there's so many impacts when you don't align your teams to customers and outcomes. And a lot of organizations are using Scrum very effectively to make their teams more efficient. Half, mm -hmm. the, you know, I was, half the work in twice the time. No, twice the work in half the time. I always <laughs> get that wrong. But the point is, and so that means things like definition of ready become really, really important. But that's mm -hmm. not what Scrum was built for. And, and Ken uh, and Jeff really, I don't think, ever wanted it to be used in that way. But the reality was you used it in the context that you were running it. So mm -hmm. that if you've got a team that's aligned to an application, that's got multiple different customers and multiple different programs that, it's, that you're doing work for, then you optimize around that. And, and mm -hmm. that's cool, but it's not the, I think the ultimate end goal is to try to get these teams better aligned to customers and outcomes. And then Scrum and, and Kanban and other techniques become naturally more aligned to that, in mm -hmm. my opinion. And that, uh, in that instance, you know, it requires organizational uh, restructure or some way, right? Like, you know, real realignment. And uh, um, a lot of organizations don't fully understand that. They bring in consultants and they tell them what to do, but ultimately they don't even know a lot of times, what, you know, why they're doing certain things. Um, you wrote a book on scaling. What, what, what are your thoughts on scaling and specifically on, on yeah. structuring around products? So I, I, I'm a big fan of a, a realignment to customers and outcomes. I'm a yeah. big fan of aligning teams, measuring the success of teams, not in terms of how much work they do, but the outcomes that those teams or teams of teams create. I also believe very strongly that you need to then build an organizational construct, whether it's called a chapter, a guild, a community, a practice or whatever, where there's people that are there to help you be more successful in your craft. Mm -hmm. I believe that promotion should be all about how many people you've helped. And I believe that bonuses should be all about how much value you've delivered to the organization um which sounds a bit like spotify meets something i don't know right. i think that is the future of of, of organizations i think that is a, a blueprint that is successful i also believe that you shouldn't scale too much you know i see these programs where they have tens of thousands of engineers working together in some way well, we knew we in, in 19, what was it, 76 in Mythical Man Month, you know, uh, Brooks's work came out that said, this doesn't work. You can't do this. <laughs> I think yeah. more than 100 people, more than 10 teams that are highly coupled, it's a nightmare to try to deliver any real value. Mm -hmm. So, so, and, and obviously the book we wrote a lot about this, this sort of descaling, this model where you try to do it with just just enough or just not enough actually mm -hmm. that you don't that and then people say well hang on we need we need a dba we need a this we need a this we need a this all of these skills these specialist skills no you don't you need a developer and you they, and they need to be able to work with these other people to get them to help them exactly. to do this you know those sort of things become really I I important so I think that is the operating model of the future. I think that organizations are experimenting with that now and we're starting to see the results. However, it's really, really hard because you've got these massive amorphous blob of middle managers whose sole purpose is not to operate in this way. 
Yeah. So, and also you incentivize people on the size of their departments. So how many people do report to you? That, you know, those sort of incentives become where yeah. you should be actually, how many people don't report to you? Excellent. <laughs> Let's get some stuff done then. Yeah. You know, it, it's those things around scaling that become really, really important. You know, it's, it's funny, I, uh, this is years ago when SpaceX wasn't quite the force that it is now. I happened yeah. to be speaking at a, um, at a software conference and the head of engineering was speaking for SpaceX, software engineering. And he did this talk and it was, he was awesome. And I was like, wow, that's cool. And so I grabbed him afterwards and asked him how big his department was. And it was like 30 something people. And they were building all the software. And I said, well, I don't really know is that big or is that small? He goes, well, we're probably two people shy. We need two more people yeah. and two more the right people. And then I said, so how many people were at NASA doing similar things? And he said, 5,000, right? <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, it's not rocket. Oh, yes, it is rocket science. And <laughs> the, the point is that, uh, not, and they were doing a lot of other things as well, obviously. So it's not quite apples for apples, but the, but the, in, but the, the essence of that, that that solution the fact that you know you can sometimes i think that when you've got more than one more than one team it becomes harder <laughs> than mm -hmm. if you just got one team you know I, I always want to sort of reduce the amount of people involved in every endeavor and mm -hmm. uh, and then use those other people to do other things rather than obviously fire them and become more efficient yeah. but uh, i think that's my message around scaling really try try not to do it if you can avoid it i mean it's almost like uh, i was talking to dave snowden uh maybe a couple of months ago for uh, he was one of my first uh, people that i interviewed well, that was an was interesting saying, start yes it was, it was and like i reached out to him because i <laughs> yeah uh, and, you know, he was kind of uh, bashing a little bit on systems thinking. I think the systems thinking is a lot of people defined it, but he was saying, like, we need to look more in the complexity management and how you scale or what happens with living systems. And that's exactly what he was saying, like, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, from complexity management, leave these agents to interact, you know, give them direction and let them interact. You don't need all this middle management. You don't need all this scaling. Uh, uh, think of it, you know, fr from that perspective. And that resonated with me. Yeah, well, and he would argue, which is right, I see the book that Nigel and the flow book that, that recently that they published, which has a really yeah. interesting, I barely understand it. It's, you know, when, when a book has like, like 20 pages of references, I'm, it's like beyond me, I think, you know, it's like, yeah. um, it's like Donald Reinenson's book, you know, that I'm like, one day I'm going to understand it. When I retire, I'm going to sit down <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to drink a lot of coffee and maybe some whiskey and, you know, uh, and, and I'm going to learn this stuff. But, but uh -huh. anyway, but what's interesting is that what's key for that, for that success is that feedback loop, right? Mm -hmm. And what's key for that feedback loop is taking uh, the right measures. And what's key for that, you know that, that those measures is that those measures must be the measures and th and this is the biggest challenge with complexity right that yeah. there's we don't necessarily understand the relationship between the elements we don't understand if if because we did this this happens etc so the measures themselves also have to be in a feedback loop <laughs> to exactly. get improved as well oh my god it's like turtles all the way down but the <laughs> but the, the idea of that 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 sort of building an organization around sort of like dare i call it an empirical organization that is very clear on its goal this is our mission this is what we're trying to do this our purpose and then and we understand uh, basically a series of hypo hypotheses that we identify from that that this yeah. is this customer's buying this because of this or this customer's using this because of, and then we continuously inspect and adapt on that and and and, and uh, through transparency and i think that's the key to try to build these empirical organizations, but but it's so hard. I mean, Amazon have probably done it at scale better than anybody, I would yeah. say. Uh, it's so hard to do that because suddenly you be, you start navel gazing, you know, you start mm -hmm. looking at yourself and optimizing <laughs> this and politics yeah. start happening and humans are all about power and prestige and ego and, mm -hmm. you know, and you bring, you know, if I was Brene Brown, I'd talk about armor and how, you know, <laughs> yeah. and all that stuff becomes important. Oh, it's so complicated. 
Hence the reason why I say keep the organization small, because then at least yeah. it can be a little bit easier to manage. Yeah, so maybe, uh, no, exactly. And I think that's the tough part. And it goes back to what we were talking about before I started recording about just how as humans, uh, you know, we have a hard time dealing with that complexity. And, uh, uh, you know, our brains don't want to put too much energy in thinking because it, <laughs> it it's taking too much, you know, uh energy uh, or whatever it is but th there's something that like you know we're all kind of nodding and agreeing like we need to think we need to understand these things but when it comes to like going in organizations helping you understand this and do it i think that's that's when it becomes difficult because i talk to a lot of people and they nod and they say yeah i get it it's the actual doing part of living that mindset and living uh uh, or putting that in understanding into practice. It, I hard. think I, I and and you know and there's a you know John Cotter says in his more depressed moments maybe we just have to wait for everybody to retire, uh, <laughs> and then it's going to be okay. Uh, and and maybe there's some truth in that because you know we, we have a, an interesting program of a charity called Year Up where we're these these kids have finished high school and then we provide well year up provides them with a, a year of vocational training and then provides them with access to an internship which then converts into a you know a, a great job with benefits and all this stuff mm -hmm. and so and it's aimed at people that have less are less fortunate that have you know maybe they're you know social economically maybe they're immigrants whatever and uh, when we run these training classes um when we used to do them in person oh my god I think that some of the constraints that we live under, you know, teaching Scrum to these these young adults is just the most rewarding experience ever because they uh, don't, they're not constrained. So suddenly, and then afterwards, they're like, yeah, I've got this idea for this clothesline and we can use <laughs> Scrum and here's this backlog. And look, can you give uh, me some advice on the back? I'm like, oh my God, these kids, <laughs> young adults, the future, uh, they aren't constrained. I think it's, you know, the, the industrial mindset that, that, that we were brought up in you know, uh, has really, it perpetuates everything, right? It yeah, and it's conditioned us to it's think conditioned in certain us, ways. And because yeah. of that, and most of the executives that are making decisions about how the organization has been changed are, be, are successful because of their success in the industrial paradigm. So because mm -hmm. of that, how is it really fair to say, hey, all that stuff you did before, all of your success can you just put it to the side for a second? I'm not saying it's not relevant. It is still relevant. It's just, this is how we're going to do it. We're not going to give you a forecast. We're going to give mm. you a, a, a goal. We're not going to give you, oh my God, why? What are you doing? And, and when things go wrong, then they instantly want to micromanage and get in. Exactly. And, and then the team feels disempowered and blah, blah, blah. So I, it's, it's challenging. Moving through, pivoting from one paradigm of work to this it was as challenging when henry ford imagine what it was like for the people that were working in farms that went oh, to that yeah. factory <laughs> yeah it's, it that was challenging now the question is if there'd been other ways of building cars how successful would they have been compared to ford and there were in france and in in europe uh, in germany obviously and it took yeah. them a while to to transform to be the same way that Ford was and then everybody yeah. was doing it but I don't know interesting times eh it is and like it just made me think of like imagine like a farmer that probably felt has decent amount of freedom now going into the factory where it was you know probably you know process process do it this way yeah. uh that, that's a huge mindset and uh um so yeah it, it is definitely a and, paradigm shift. and that's the reason why they had to introduce schools and benefits and health care and all yeah. these other things because the farmer would have just left because <laughs> they're like exactly. i ain't working in this <laughs> my god <laughs> well that's the thing and like it's the same thing like so i work with a lot of project managers that you know become scrum masters as you know that's a very common path and a lot of times people do want to change but they're like milan uh, I'm, I'm really trying, but after being project manager for 20, 30 years, some of this stuff is really difficult. So, uh, you know, I have to work 10 times harder on just reconditioning my brain. And not <laughs> saying stuff and not yeah. jumping in and not telling people how to do things and not those things are hard. I find them hard. You know, I'm yeah. not, 
I, I certainly could never be a scrum master. That is not my my bent or my sort of focus. I, yeah. I you know, the last thing I want. I'm a product owner. I I care yeah. deeply about delivering value, understanding customers, understanding hypotheses, testing those hypotheses. That's what I get my. That's what I'm excited about. Building yeah. businesses. You know, that's kind of my thing, right? But there's many times when I'm trying to work with my team. When my and we obviously we use Scrum at Scrum.org, and yeah. I really want to tell them what they need to do. Yeah. And I get so <laughs> super frustrated and I step away from the Zoom and I go and get a cup of coffee and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but that, and that's just the reality. I mean, come on, yeah. like, you know, people, but it's also the great thing as well, because if you can step back from yourself just for enough and laugh at yourself. So I think, you know, one of the, one of the values, you know, obviously the scrum values, courage, focus, commitment, respect, openness. I, I think one of the values we miss is humor or hubris. You know, this yeah. idea that you can, you can laugh at yourself and sort of like inspect yourself and say, Oh, what an idiot I am. Why did I just spend the last yeah. half an hour telling that person how they need to do that job? Because I know best and I really don't. You know, yeah. because I like to hear my own voice, because I want them to make progress, because, you know, and then and then how do I motivate? How do I get them to do the things that I would like them to do? How can I come in with a scientific mindset, not a priest, not a politician, not a litigator? You know, mm -hmm. th those sort of approaches to helping people. Um, I don't know. It's tough. It's, and I think it goes back to what you said. I think, you know, um, humor, but also awareness, what you were describing, just being aware that, hey, you know, this is where I am and just the unknowing to step away. And this is another thing that I've been talking to people. I think um, generally we're not, you know, you talk about mindset, right? And you, you mentioned a couple of times. Most people don't even know what mindset is similar to culture. Like, you know, we just talk about it, but like if you, uh, there are few scrum masters that I know that understand psychology and that understand like how people think. And it's not necessarily a scrum master that needs to know and you have to, you know, be psychologist, but it's just understanding like what motivates people. And I think that's something in scrum and in agile that we focus too much on sometimes on practices and doing stuff without understanding the internally, like how do you help somebody actually change their mindset? I you think, can't just say, you know, hey, Dave, do this. No, no, well, we can, you can, and Dave will go, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and what the hell are you talking about? And what an idiot exactly. he is. But no, the what's interesting is I think the next evolution of the agile coach, scrum master, whatever, um, uh, agile captain, one of the companies I work with, they call their scrum masters agile captains, which uh -huh. I, I kind of like because you get a hat. Um, uh -huh. I love that. But the, um, the, the next evolution of that, of that role uh, is very much going to be, I think, building a bridge to professional coaching. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, it's not something I personally want to do. Uh, but it is, I think it's certainly something a, as, a, as the product person at scrum.org. I mean, yeah, although I'm not the product owner anymore, we have individual product owners that are working on the yeah. products that scrum.org bring uh, to market and, and supports them. But the, uh, I'm going to try to build that, that, that bridge and try to help my product owners do that. Because I think, mm -hmm. I think that one thing that I've realized uh, when I, I, I've been to lots and lots of organizations. I'm very fortunate that I <laughs> ponce around the world talking to people like you and go, oh, that's really interesting and being curious and getting that opportunity, right? Yeah. Um, wh what I've noticed is the people that the coaches um, or the, the ag scrum masters that have that professional discipline mm. are significantly better than the coaches that don't, or they're more likely to be better, I should say. Exactly, I mean, you know, yeah. people are people and sometimes you get that. But like, for instance, they understand who the customer is of mm -hmm. their support and they understand where their boundary is. They understand what, and, and add to that professional facilitation, this, you know, whether it's liberating structures or visual facilitation or whatever, that if you mm -hmm. combine those two skills or disciplines into that role, it's not just knowing the framework that's cool then i think you can do exactly what you describe you mm -hmm. really can i don't want to say work the team but enable the team and the people in the team to work more effectively together because 
nine times out of 10, it isn't the technical problems. It isn't the organizational problems. It's how the team are dealing with those technical problems. Yeah. Those it's people problems. <laughs> it's the people side, right? Yeah. And it, it's frustrating that we as a society kind of, and particularly English, I mean, England, oh mm -hmm. my God, you know, we were not allowed to talk about feelings. We uh, weren't allowed to, if I'd have said to my mum, oh, mum, I'm, I'm really, you know, upset about it. Go get, yeah, pull it out, pull your finger out, <laughs> lad. You're going to be fine. Nobody likes a cry, you know, a cry baby. I'm yeah. like, okay, mum, you know, and it, it's this sort of like oppressed kind of like, you keep them down, stiff up a lip. Well, the stiff up a lip's great, isn't it? Because you're really going to get a lot of work when everybody's so tense. We, uh, we talk a lot about um, um, uh, uh, sort of like social responsibility and the connection with agility, right? Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people are talking about that, you know, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's, you know, the, you know, the, the Me Too movement, whether it's any of these things and why it's so important. Because high-performing, amazing teams where are full of people that aren't scared mm -hmm. but, and, and that is now you know if i if i was i mean i'm middle-aged white dude right white male so i've got all the advantages all the privilege so now if i'm not if i'm a, a lady or, or maybe i'm african-american or whatever yeah. um i'm i there's a lot more stuff that i'm having to bring to this team there's a lot mm -hmm. more stuff outside of the team that's getting in the way of me being successful. If I don't understand those things, how am I going to be successful? How am I going to basically create that environment for these team people to work together? How can, you know, it's, it's I think all those things are things we're going to have to think more about because exactly. the nature of the work is a lot more complex. Knowledge mm -hmm. work is going to become more complex and if it that requires people to be engaged that requires you have to bring a lot more of you to it and that mm -hmm. means we need to create environments that are more enabling that so um that people thing that culture thing that behavior thing is going to be really really important i think for the future yeah. i mean it's always been important right it's just like and i think maybe it's more of that industrial mindset focus on what you can measure and see versus what you can't and yes. uh, a lot of what we've focused on is what you can measure um i want to maybe shift gears a little bit because uh, i want to uh, uh, i brought up ken at the beginning and you said you you've met ken 20 years ago yeah, uh, maybe that, yeah. yeah like what what's the most important thing that you learn from ken <laughs> Is there anything specific that stands out? Maybe a couple? Be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's given me a lot of anti-patterns. No, no, yeah. seriously. Ken is one of the most amazing, incredible people I have ever met in my life. Yeah. He's a friend, a mentor. I aspire to have his curiosity. Yeah. I um, style, we're very stylistically very different, but I think that's very complimentary. I ran a workshop with him. This was when I was a, a research director at Forrester Research, and I invited him in, oh my God, <laughs> to this workshop. I uh, talk about broken plates everywhere, but ultimately it was an incredible <laughs> learning experience for everybody because, yeah. you know, he literally, he, he, fate, when people said, oh, blah, 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 because of blah, 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 he goes, no you're wrong that isn't now that's not my style but yeah. it, it was definitely his and when you add me to it it became really so he's taught me a lot of things so probably the most important thing that he's taught me is that to ask this very simple question over and over again how does this help the mission mm -hmm. he he brings everything back to our mission which was uh, previously was improving the profession of software delivery now it is to help people and teams solve complex problems and because it, we're much broader than software and and it's much broader than than, than that 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 discipline but the the he, he asks that of everything that we do you know i give him loads of metrics on people on our website and all this and he goes that's very interesting dave um, how does that help our mission again <laughs> and so the, for the first three years of me working at scrum.org, that caught me out continuously. Now it doesn't. I'm prepared for it. And even I actually say it to him when he's going off on, we should be doing this because, you know, he's a genius. So yeah. when you say these things, he's like, no, we should be doing this. You're an idiot. No, we should be doing this. I'm like, how does it help the mission, Kenny? He's like, hmm. 
damn you. So um, I think that's one thing that he's really, really good at. The other thing that he's really, really, really insightful around is the use of empiricism or this sort of empirical process. He encourages it continuously. He's always challenging it, meaning, so what's the smallest thing you can do that demonstrates some value that we can learn from and then feed that back? What's the smallest chunk? And, and he does that because I have a, you know, I'm like all of us, I've got, I've got ego and power and all those issues that, you know, I got from a boy and being chubby yeah. and you know, <laughs> having the braces and no girl talking to me. So I want to yeah. build these huge things from day one. And I have these grand visions of, you know, building palaces and, you know, we all yeah. do, right? I, and, and he's really, really, really good at saying, Dave, that, that's great. I love that. But what is the smallest thing you can thing do they, first? Yeah. And um, and I think that's something that he does does an amazing job. And the the sparkle in his eye when he when he's thinking about something, I I haven't seen it. You know, I've been fortunate to work with some amazing people. You know, I mentioned some of them like Grady, Eva, etc. Mm. And that's the thing that sort of brings all those people together. I think something that 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 sparkle, that mischievous. Yeah. you know and that kind of naughtiness of oh what about this and and i i love that i think that's the yeah. great thing but i think that's probably the most the the mission and the empiricism are probably the most um valuable things that he's taught me over this 20 year relationship yeah. and also that he he likes bacon and sweet things <laughs> combined ideally Ah, <laughs> yes, wow. uh, hey, you'll be surprised. You know, some of the stuff I joke around, but uh, uh, some of the stuff that I've eaten uh, across the world, like you would never <laughs> think that those two things would go together. And uh, oh, uh, I do. You know, Marmalade it, yeah. and bacon. <laughs> Try uh, it. Um, so maybe like uh, I, I do like something that. It doesn't bother me, but uh, I just like everybody's like, I was joking around, like, you know, with some of these older guys that started a big part of this movement. I was like, you guys are getting older, you know, yeah. uh, and there's still a little bit of bitterness between people. And I was like, most of us have jobs and enjoy like better way of working because of you guys. Right. Yeah. And you have differences, but um, we're just. I, I know I am thankful for every single person that had uh, any say in this movement. And uh, I also see Ken, like you said, you know, there are certain things I agree that I don't even know. So I can't agree or disagree. Right. But one thing that I talk to people and one thing that comes up most often than anything else is that if it wasn't for Ken, that scrum and agile problem wouldn't be what it is today, just because of his, um, um, kind of creativity and, uh, you know, introducing the CSM, starting the Scrum Alliance, uh, Agile Alliance, it's just like, the you know, where he, where he's been, he's, you know, made a huge impact. And I joke around with XP guys and I was talking to Chad, like, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, you guys, if you guys had uh, Ken, you know, XP would be probably more popular than Scrum. <laughs> Um, and uh, what are your thoughts on uh, on the impact, uh, Ken's impact? And I, you know, you may be biased, or you you know, whatever. Or biased. You know. Uh, but any thoughts on the, so, the impact that Ken le is leaving? Uh, uh, has I mean, I, I I don't think it's a one. I'd like to officially say it's not a competition. Did Ken do more than Martin Fowler? Did Martin Fowler do more than Jim Highsmith? There isn't a. It's not like the English Premier League. There's not a winner, <laughs> uh, yeah. and and the top four get into Europe, That's uh, or maybe only the it. top yeah. maybe in the top three this year because of because they're doing because English clubs are doing so well which is annoying by the way but the um uh the I I so I don't think it's a competition do yeah. I think that Ken brought a unique set of like a great diverse team he brought some things he brought a passion for building organizations and constructs that actually grew the opportunity for everybody one of the most yeah. exciting things about CSM and PSM now is that he provided a mechanism that allowed everybody, everybody potentially to, to teach it or to benefit from it, to get access to it. It wasn't just, 
he didn't hoard it, you know, as a special skill. And he brought that to the, to the world. I think he did a fantastic job there. I think he did a, a, an amazing job sort of like basically marketing. He, 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 but whether it was luck or whether it was insight, I, I don't know. But this idea that, hey, people want to prove that they've been to this. The Agile Alliance was only formed because a bunch of people missed the meeting in Snowbird and, yeah. and, and afterwards and said, oh, I should have been there. How do I sign this? <laughs> and they went, oh, God. So they created this this Agile Alliance. And um, I think it was people were PayPaling or it was even before PayPal, yeah. 150 yeah. bucks to everybody to sign it and to put their name on the manifesto. And then that built an organization. They built a non-for-profit around it, et cetera, et cetera, or a charity actually mm -hmm. around it. And then Scrum Alliance was a non-for-profit. And then, you know, so the, the, it's just, I think he was, I think he brought some unique things. Um, and but maybe it was did, also that serendipity that we talked about. It was yeah. also uh, the, the good, uh, you know, good thing to do at the right time. I, yes, I think that his personality and, and the skills that he brought were perfect timing. Add to that, you know, you had Jeff who did a really good job of that executive message because he, mm -hmm. which he does a fantastic job of and telling those stories mm -hmm. about fighter jets and, mm -hmm. you know, and all that kind of things, which, you know, you, I, add to that, you know, you got people like the XP community really focused on some of the very important engineering practices necessary to mm -hmm. deliver done software at, at every sprint add to that you know you've got organizations like thoughtworks amplifying that message with their own mm -hmm. unique spin but you know yeah. add to that the 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 world changed where digital became so much more valuable and yeah. the, the organize and everybody was like we want to be like facebook we want to be like google you know exactly. uh, you know every it, it, timing and having that right mix of personality i think uh, I think is, is what it's about. What, what I do know is that Ken is um, a ver Ken is an inspiration, and and I think that uh, all of them in that community that that first that bunch of old people now, <laughs> um, the older people, we need to respect them, and uh, because they did something, they changed the world, and because of that, yeah. that you and I have careers that are both valuable and enjoyable. And exactly. uh, they, they did that for millions of people. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, you know, when you look at, you know, PSM, PSPO, CSM, CSPO classes, I mean, there, there's millions of people and it's, you know, it's not yeah. slowing down in a sense, maybe, you know, a little bit uh, with COVID or whatever. But there's a lot of people like just learning about, uh, about Over Scrum. A about... million people, every, new people every month, according to Google, every yeah. month come to our website. Yeah. Add to that the amount of people going to all the other websites. So yeah. the, it's amazing. There's millions of people practicing Scrum and Agile thinking every day or trying to. Yeah. It's, it's just an incredible thing that's happened in the world. Um, but I do think that we need to step back and look at it and, and try to sort of get to the essence of it and try to start thinking about how I, as an individual, how I can contribute to this community and to my organization, to my team. And mm -hmm. uh, I think if we can do that, then we can capture all of this and really take it to the next level. Exactly. Yeah. So what do you think as far as the next level, then uh, what do you think we need to do? Because like what I'm seeing also is like Scrum is being applied in other industries. So like yeah. it's uh, I'm assuming like the COVID that these crises will only, you know, in probably next two, three, five years, get a wave of people um, that, you know, never consider Scrum. I mean, some of the classes, people that are in classes that I'm seeing, it's like, you know, teachers, construction like yeah. like it's amazing to see that and uh it's also challenging at times because like you know i remember back in the day you know it was like trying to explain to some of the it people about scrum and it was definitely and now it's not like most people kind of get it they understand it uh but trying to explain it to people across different uh uh, industries is also now kind of it reminds me of that a little bit uh it, it's very interesting because it's so the it, the classroom is becoming more diverse it's not just it people it's 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 outside so do you see that as well and uh yes is that, yeah 
in in short yes i think there's a a huge expand happening for the use of these ideas outside of traditional software development it uh even product development uh, i myself tasked myself last year with helping um somebody a vet who runs um the animal hospital uh, which is in our upstate new york and she was looking at how she, her organization about 20 people could better manage because of covid fundamental change to how the patient is delivered by the person that pays the owner mm -hmm. and how they engage with their customers and so they had this huge pivot right as a business to support in this new covid protocol world and um, so i thought oh i'm going to try to help her use scrum she actually got it really quick and right. it's, it, but it did, it required me to change how I position Scrum. Historically, I've always, you know, talked about the waterfall, talked about all of these things. She didn't know what a waterfall was. It's somewhere where she uh -huh. goes and visits on vacation, right? <laughs> she didn't know any of these things. So yeah. I, I had to sort of like change the bogeyman, change the, yeah. you know, all of these. And, and actually that we have done that in all of our classes or many of our classes, I wouldn't say it's perfect yet. Yeah. And our assessments as well, we've tried to take take out that, that heavy bias towards software development, the examples mm -hmm. that we use, the parallels that we try to draw. We try to change all of that, but it's hard for people like us that have been doing this for a while because exactly. our standard pattern that, you know, say, hey, watch Scrum. Well, Scrum is this approach. It's very different to Waterfall that takes you to people are like, oh, I have no idea what you just said. Oh, so you have to step back and and ask questions you have to use the scientific or heuristic you know you have to use that so socratic method and and you have to like lead slowly through the ideas like the idea of a backlog is really great she's like oh yeah let's use on oh, is this trello oh i like this I'm like yeah it's true yeah. you know and then how do i do it was just it was hilarious and, and yeah. they used it and they found it useful now, the, the biggest yeah. issue that she has is keeping the momentum going, because it, 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 what they found is they did it, they fixed some things, then those things weren't less of a problem, right? So anymore, so there was less problems. So suddenly, so how can she keep, that's the challenge that she's facing and we're, we're oh, trying to sustain it, yeah. sustaining it, you know, the sort of yeah. like almost a little bit of a hangover after using it, you know? Yeah. Um, so maybe as a last question here, um, what message do you have for the uh, your uh, I mean our agile community? You know, we started this conversation with like that we we should work more together. That we should uh, you know I, I think respect is there. It's just more like having uh, uh, you know maybe a little bit more opportunities to collaborate. But what what I don't know what well, that would be my message, but what, what, what is Dave's message uh, for uh, for our community? I think I so I 100% agree. I think the these intellectual battles that we get into these 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 are oh, this is better than this and why is scrums rubbish and uh, safe is rubbish and less is naive and all these words that we use. They're just stupid. The bottom line is, I think that ultimately the way forward is to practice kindness, empathy, to challenge ego, to step back from, to provide space to step back and say, hey, okay, so they've got a different point of view. What, what, what is the real difference? Why is it? Uh, why does I? Why does it make me feel? Why do I have this guttural reaction to it? You know, and and try to and and bring kindness. I think that, you know, the, the opportunity that we have to effectively deliver better ways of working for our children and their and their children, for that we have the ability to help our organizations execute more effectively on their missions to make the world a better place. We have that great opportunity. We've learned some stuff. We should be sharing those ideas. Let's not hoard it and become that, oh no, you have to talk to Dave and he's $2,000 an hour. I wish, wish I was, but I'm really not. <laughs> uh, um, the, you know, th let's try to be kind. Let's try to be empathic. Let's try to encourage diversity. All of those things are things that we, we should be doing. And frankly, if you're spending your time and getting your kicks out of being rude about another person's set of ideas i'm not sure you're necessarily doing it right now it doesn't mean you can't challenge them that doesn't mean you can't ask them questions that doesn't mean that you can't but do it in a kind 
collaborative bridge building way because um, there's some amazing ideas out there. We haven't got the answers, none of us. Mm -hmm. Every situation is slightly different as, as Dave Snowden would say, that's the problem, right? That's the problem <laughs> exactly. with complexity. Uh, just because this, there's no such thing as best practices, but there are such things as practices and empiricism and those things really help us. So let's, um, let's build some bridges and change the world.